Hey folks, uh, thanks everyone for joining this workshop. Uh, I'm Kunal Jha and I'm the Senior Product Manager in the Sage Maker team. Along with me today is our Senior Machine Learning Solutions Architect, Sean Morgan. Today in this workshop, we want to showcase how to utilize SageMaker Studio Notebooks to build machine learning models. Let's look at some of the learning objectives of today. This is a 200 level intermediate course where we assume some basic understanding of machine learning. By the end of this workshop, you learn how to launch and use SageMaker Studio Notebooks, install and explore functionalities of some popular open source extensions that augment your workflows within Studio Notebooks, and learn how to track and manage uh, training and data processing jobs, and thus test machine learning model performance. We'll deliver the content mostly through live product demonstration. Note that this is a virtual workshop, which means you can try all of these demos yourself. And Sean will shortly provide instructions on how you can get these set up and try these demos. So first, let's get started with a broad introduction of SageMaker Studio. Amazon SageMaker Studio is the first fully integrated development environment designed specifically for machine learning that brings everything you need for ML under one unified visual user interface. From a web-based visual interface, you can perform all the machine learning development steps required to prepare data and build, train, and deploy machine learning models. Using SageMaker Studio's integrated capabilities for machine learning, you can eliminate months of writing custom integration code and ultimately reduce cost. You have access to purpose-built tools for every step of the machine learning development process, be it labeling, data preparation, feature engineering, statistical bias detection, auto ML, training, tuning, hosting, explainability, monitoring, and workflows. Now let's go through some uh, parts of the overall machine learning work workflow in terms of preparing the data and building the machine learning model and training, uh, and then find the deployment. So first, focusing on preparation of data. There are multiple feature sets within SageMaker Studio that helps you within to prepare data. One being Data Wrangler, where you can import, prepare, and transform and visualize data directly within SageMaker Studio. You can integrate uh, Data Wrangler in your machine learning workflows to simplify and streamline data pre-processing and feature engineering without any coding. Studio Notebooks also has built-in integration with Spark, Hive, and Presto running on EMR clusters and data lakes running on S3, and gives you the ability to debug Spark jobs without leaving the experience of Studio Notebooks. SageMaker Processing uh, allows you to run steps for data pre- or post-processing, feature engineering, data validation, or model evaluation workloads. Amazon SageMaker Feature Store, on one side, is a fully managed purpose-built repository to store, share, and manage features for ML models. Now we want to, uh, let's take a quick look on, regarding building machine learning models. SageMaker Studio provides all the tools you need to iteratively try different modeling techniques in order to evaluate their performance. You can pick different algorithms, including over 20 that are built in and optimized for SageMaker. Over 300 pre-built models from popular model zoos available within just a few clicks and over 15 pre-built solution templates. Inside SageMaker Studio, you can run the models on a small scale to see results and view reports on their performance so that you can come up with high quality working prototypes. The key capabilities within Studio for building machine learning models are a fully managed Jupyter Notebooks. Amazon SageMaker Studio Notebooks are at the center of SageMaker Studio end-to-end -end integrated development environment, or IDE, where you can collaboratively prepare, build, train, debug, track, deploy, and perform all the machine learning steps uh, at one place through seamless integration with different AWS services. 
Studio notebooks are shared with a single click, so colleagues can get the same notebook saved in the same place. Beyond that, Studio has over 20 built-in algorithms available in pre-built container images that you can use to quickly train and run inferences. You can utilize SageMaker Jumpstart for pre-built solution and open source models to quickly get you started with machine learning. You can use AutoML to automatically, you can use SageMaker Autopilot to automatically build, train, and tune the best machine learning model based on your data while allowing to maintain full control and visibility. You can directly deploy the model to production with just one click or iterate to improve the model quality. SageMaker Autopilot eliminates the heavy lifting of building ML models. Beyond that, SageMaker Studio is also optimized for many popular deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow, Apache MXNet, PyTorch, and more. Frameworks are always up to date with the latest version and are optimized for performance on AWS. Now let's take a look at the next step of training machine learning models. SageMaker reduces the time and cost to train and tune machine learning models without needing to manage infrastructure. With SageMaker Studio, you can easily train and tune machine learning models using purpose-built tools and manage and track experiments, automatically choose the optimal hyperparameters, debug training jobs, and automatically monitor utilization of system resources. All step of training workflow can be automated into a machine learning workflow, so you can scale to thousands of training experiments. SageMaker offers the highest performing ML compute infrastructure, including P4D instances, which provide up to 60% lower cost to train machine learning models compared to previous generation instances. To make training faster, you can also enable SageMaker Training Compiler and immediately achieve up to 50% speed up through graph and kernel level optimization. The key capabilities within SageMaker Studio to train machine learning models are experiment management and model tuning, where you can help track iterations to your machine learning model by capturing input parameters, configurations, and results, and storing them as experiments. You can use SageMaker Debugger to capture metrics and profile training jobs in real time so that you can correct performance problems quickly. You can have uh, distributed training, and SageMaker Studio kind of makes it faster by automatically splitting deep learning models and training data sets across GPU instances with fewer than 10 lines of code. And you have managed spot training where SageMaker provides managed spot training to help you reduce training costs by up to 90%. Training jobs are automatically run when compute capacity becomes available and are made resilient to interruptions caused by a change in capacity. Finally, uh, we come to the last step of the machine learning workflow, which is deployment of machine learning models. SageMaker Studio makes it easy to deploy and manage machine learning models at scale. As a fully managed service, it takes care of setting up and managing instances for inference, ensuring software version compatibilities and patching version. SageMaker offers more than 70 instant types and allows developer to access deployed models through API requests with response times as low as few milliseconds. SageMaker provides scalable and cost-effective ways to deploy machine learning model, whether it's one model or a large number of model, and provides multi-model endpoints and multi-container endpoints, enabling you to deploy thousands of models on a single endpoint, improving cost-effectiveness. Through these different steps, I wanted to take you through a brief glance of what all feature sets and capabilities are of offered within SageMaker Studio across all steps of machine learning development. Now we want to, uh, in, in, in the next few slides, we want to focus on uh, specifically on SageMaker Studio Notebooks, which is at the heart of the Studio 
integrated development environment. And during the course of the next one, two slides, as well as the demonstration by Sean, we want you to get up to speed to how to effectively utilize Studio Notebooks, be able to, uh, how to augment your flows with open source extensions and uh, how to build certain workflows. So let's dive a bit deeper into capabilities of SageMaker Studio Notebooks, which are integral part of Studio in terms of powering and complementing these rich set of features to provide an easy and integrated experience of machine learning. You can start your notebook without spinning up compute resources. So you spend no time waiting for an instance to spin up uh, to just start working on your notebook. You can easily dial up or down available resources to match your workload so that you only pay for what you need and you can customize the environment to uniquely suit your, your enterprise firm's need uh, so that you can bring your own image packages, extensions, and also automate customizations with lifecycle configurations. Studio makes it easy to share notebooks with your coworkers and you can share a complete snapshot of your work so that you can give and receive feedback to make quick progress on your data science work. Studio now comes with Jupyter Lab 3 notebooks that we have recently launched to help boost productivity of data scientists and developers building machine learning models on SageMaker and provide support for the latest open source Jupyter extensions. Few key features to call out, and this is something that we'll see along the way in the demonstration also, is with the integrated debugger, you can inspect variables and step through breakpoints while you interactively build your data science and machine learning code. In addition, using the language server extension, you can enable modern IDE functionalities such as tab completion, syntax highlighting, jump to references, and variable renaming across notebooks and modules, making you much more productive. I'm now, going, I'm now going to hand it off to Sean. We'll show through live demos the usage of SageMaker Studio Notebooks. Thank you, Kanal. For today's workshop, we're going to have follow along AWS accounts that have been pre-provisioned for you to use for free. If you're watching the recording of this, you can follow along as well in your own account. We'll be sure to post the various GitHub links for the repositories that we'll be running. Those of you following on, on the live video though, please go to this URL at dashboard.eventengine.run slash login. You'll be met at this page here where you can enter an event hash, which we are going to post now in the chat. After pasting your event hash and clicking accept, you'll get brought to the login screen where you can select from one of three different options. The first option allows you to use just a standard email with a one-time password. The second option allows you to log in with your amazon.com retail account. And the last option that I'll be selecting is for Amazon employees. After you've authenticated and entered our event, you'll notice that you have been provisioned a certain account. For this account under the Studio Notebooks webinar, we're going to select AWS console in order to load up the traditional web-based console. Next, go ahead and select open console and a new tab will be created that will land you on the familiar AWS console page. The account that you have logged in to has been pre-provisioned with a SageMaker Studio domain, a SageMaker user, and something that's known as a lifecycle configuration. If you go to services and then select Amazon SageMaker, you'll be greeted with this page in the account. And on the left panel, you can go ahead and select control panel. It is here that you'll see that your SageMaker domain has been pre-provisioned already. And a SageMaker user has already been added to the domain known as workshop user. 
I mentioned that these accounts had pre-provisioned lifecycle configurations. So let's talk about what those are. Lifecycle configurations allow either administrators or end users to run scripts at the time of the Jupyter server launch or for at kernel launch time. In our particular demo today, we have a lifecycle configuration that is going to pre-install Jupyter extensions onto our SageMaker Studio domain. As Kunal mentioned, one of the really nice features of SageMaker Studio is its customizability. We now offer Jupyter Lab 3 notebooks as part of the Studio IDE. And for that, you can read more on this blog here in case you're following along. We'll post this link in the chat as well. But essentially, this announces the launch of our Jupyter 3 notebooks and shows how you can upgrade your existing Studio users to use this. For those of you following around on the live demo, your account has already been provisioned with Jupyter Lab 3 notebooks as well as lifecycle configurations. So there's no need for any more setup. If you've made it to the control panel, you want to go to workshop user and go over to the launch app button where you can click this and you'll see the option of two different SageMaker Studio IDEs. We're going to use the traditional SageMaker Studio Jupyter Lab. So I'm going to right click this and click open link in new tab. You'll be loaded into our landing page of SageMaker Studio, where you can see a number of different uh, getting started tutorials, things like Jumpstart, as Kunal mentioned, uh, different uh, ways to launch various notebooks and system terminals. And we'll be going through majority of this as we go through our demo. To get started, though, I wanted to show what our lifecycle configuration has pre-provisioned within this account. And then I'll show how those of you following along on the YouTube video can do this as well. If I go to the extension manager tab on the bottom left, I can go ahead and click this and click enable. Uh, this will allow a kind of visual viewing of what extensions have been pre-provisioned onto this SageMaker Studio IDE. A number of these extensions are, are there by default from SageMaker Studio. Things like JupyterLab Git are always provisioned for SageMaker Studio domains. For this particular demo though, I have pre-installed what's known as a language server protocol or JupyterLab LSP, which will help us for modern IDE features such as syntax highlighting, uh, jump to definition and code refactoring. I'm going to close this extensions management tab now. And I'm going to go over what the other buttons are within the studio domain. If I click on the top left icon, I'll see a folder directory. This directory corresponds to my particular SageMaker users home directory on our shared network mount. I can place various code repositories, data sets, or anything that I'd like to be specific to my particular user in this directory. We're going to go ahead and clone the code repository for today's demo. And for that, we're going to go over to this GitHub link, which we will post in the chat as well. It is the Studio Notebook webinar. Uh, it's a very lightweight repo, which just has the demonstration that we're going to run through today. Uh, and if you go over to the code button within GitHub and select the HTTPS link, you can actually go ahead and copy this link. I'll go back to my Studio. IDE, you can see clearly with the Jupyter uh, SageMaker brain icon. And I'm going to go and select the second tab now, which is the Git button. So if I go ahead and click the Git button on the panel on the left-hand side, 
and I'm going to zoom in here a little bit, you'll see that you have three options presented to you. We're going to go ahead and click clone a repository, and I can actually paste in that URL that I had copied from the GitHub repository. I'll click clone. And then we'll see that in our directory tab, that new repository has been cloned in as Studio Notebook Webinar. I'm going to open that directory and then open the corresponding IPython notebook here, known as TensorFlow 2 California Housing Regression Dataset, which is what we'll be running through today. This particular example is going to use a California housing data set, and we're going to run a regression problem. To do this, you're going to want to select the correct kernel and instance type that you want to back your notebook as you develop. One of the strengths of SageMaker Studio is that you can use different instances for different notebook tabs, and can, you can choose the correct kernel that you want to run for them. I'm going to go up here and select the kernel first, you can see that there is a switch kernel button that I will click. And for this particular notebook, we can see that we want to run the TensorFlow 2.3 Python 3.7 CPU optimized kernel. The images are alphabetical, so I'm going to scroll down and you'll see that we have pre-built optimized images for several machine learning, popular machine learning frameworks. Things like MXNet, PyTorch, TensorFlow are all available out of the box. So I will go to the TensorFlow 2.3 Python 3.7 CPU optimized kernel, as I was recommended in the top of the notebook. And I'm going to go ahead and click Select. Now our notebook kernel is being provisioned. We'll give it a moment to run. And we can talk about some of the other features of this IDE. We'll see at the bottom that our kernel is actively starting. And when it does, we'll be able to see the CPU and memory utilization for our kernel, as well as the CPU and memory utilization for our Jupyter server. This is really handy because if you've ever happened to have run out of memory in a particular Jupyter kernel, uh, what will happen is you won't actually crash the studio interface. You'll just crash the single kernel. So it's very flexible uh, in this regards as well. Now that we can see our kernel is active, we can see the memory comp utilization here. Uh, I can go ahead and look at the other options that I could have chose from at the top. The first one being the switch instance type button. I'm going to go ahead and click this to show how easy it is to change a, the instance that backs a particular notebook. In this case, we're going to keep our MLT3 medium. It's a very lightweight and cheap instance, and it will do the job for today's uh, demonstration. You'll notice there's a selection of accelerated computing instances, GPU instances, memory optimized and compute optimized instances as well, where you can see the vCPUs, the number of GPUs and the memory available. These four instances are in our fast launch section where we have a warm pool of instances. And if you go ahead and turn off this little button here, you can see the full selection of SageMaker ML instances for which you can utilize for your notebooks. Some of these have up to 768 gigs of RAM, which can be useful for various applications that you'd want to use. I'm going to go ahead and click Cancel, though, because our T3 medium that has already been provisioned is sufficient for today's demo. So let's go ahead and look at what some of our JupyterLab extensions have provided us, and then we'll go ahead and show how you can install additional extensions, as well as for those of you following along, how you can catch up to the extensions that we have provisioned. For example, uh, you can see there's automatic highlighting of the same variables. If I go ahead and throw a few spaces in here, you'll see that I'll get a syntactic error that I can hover over and see the result for why. Error 303, too many blank lines from PyCode style. So I'll go ahead and fix that. There's a lot of different extensions, and we're just using a sample of them today. But we'll talk about the way in which you can install the ones that you would like to use. To do that, you're going to want to open a terminal on your SageMaker Studio IDE. We're going to go to the File button, select New, and then Terminal. It 
It is here. You'll see a link to the documentation on Jupyter Lab extensions and how to utilize them as well. But if you follow along with me, uh, we can do this ourselves. So I'm going to clear this. And the first thing you need to know is that the Jupyter extensions are installed into a specific Conda repository in our Jupyter Lab 3 instances. So I'm going to go ahead and write Conda Activate Studio. This is your first time using Conda. Uh, you can go ahead and, and read some documentation on the side, but it won't be overly uh, needed for this demonstration. Just know that we're switching the environment for which we're going to install packages. At this point, if you are following along on your own and you don't have a IDE that's provisioned with the various extensions we already have, this is where you can go ahead and, and install those as well. We have a public repository that shows that has various lifecycle configuration examples. And one of them is the way in which to install the extensions that we already have in today's demo. We'll be pasting this link on the chat, but you can also go along to aws-samples, SageMaker Studio lifecycle config examples, and then under scripts, install LSP features, you'll find the code. You can see that we've done things like pip installing our Jupyter Lab LSP after we've Conda activated our studio environment, as well as done things like installing the Jupyter Lab spell checker as well. If you're following along on your own, you can simply copy this entire script and paste it into the terminal to catch up to where we are. For those of you following along on the live stream though, I did remove one particular useful library from the lifecycle configuration. So we're gonna go ahead and install that on our own now. Again, we are in the Studio Conda environment. So I'm going to go ahead and pip install the library known as Jupyter Lab Code Formatter and the library black. Um, an example for this may be that your team has decided to standardize using a tool such as black on your notebooks as well as Python files. So we'll go ahead and install this particular package and you can see that it goes quite quickly. And after it's completed, I will just clear the screen. And then I'm gonna go ahead and run a command to restart our Jupyter server. Uh, so we have aliased this within all of the SageMaker uh, IDEs. So if you type restart Jupyter server and hit enter, you'll see a message that says we're restarting the Jupyter server. This page should refresh in a few seconds. Note that any terminals will be closed. Uh, and if it doesn't refresh, just go ahead and refresh your browser. So we'll give it a few seconds until the terminal is exited. And there it has. So I will go ahead and click refresh on my browser at this point. Before I do, I want to note that there is that the icons that are available here right now are a uh, are available as Git and then <laughs> this one as well to display the notebook diff. But after I refresh, we're going to see a new icon available. We now see this new black formatting icon that says format the notebook. So we're gonna go ahead and click this as if this was a requirement for my team's development. You'll notice it will automatically format the notebook to the specifications of the black formatter, which are configurable uh, and can be added as part of your lifecycle configuration so that all of your teams are standardized. I hope that was a good introduction to the various customizations that can be done in your stu Studio Lab interface. Now we're going to move towards how to build machine learning models using SageMaker Studio Notebooks. We already have our notebook up and we're running the correct kernel, TensorFlow 2.3 on a T3 medium instance. So we can get started with the process here. We have a various importings of libraries here that we're going to do. Uh, so we'll go ahead and run this cell. One of the cells actually imports from the California Housing TF2 Python file uh, that is located in here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and open that as another tab because we'll be jumping back and forth. 
you'll notice that the extensions that we've installed are not just for notebooks. You can see the same syntax highlighting is going on here in our Python uh, file as well. Expected two blank lines following the imports of a module. So I'll go ahead and add that in order to clear up some of the uh, syntax highlighting issues. We're going to go through that module in depth as we go ahead and utilize it. But for now, it can just be helpful to have them both open in two separate tabs. For today's problem, we're going to be downloading a California housing data set. We'll do some exploratory data analysis on the data set prior to determining what type of model we want to build. I'm going to go ahead and download, make some data directories, a training directory, a testing directory, and a data directory within there. Um, and then I'm going to utilize this function known as fetch California housing. You can see that we imported fetch California housing from the SK Learns data sets. And we'll go ahead and run this cell here. If I want to inspect what this data set looks like, I can call simply dataset.frame, that makes it a pandas data frame, and then run the head function so we can visualize it. You'll notice that this data set has a lot of various information about the, the, the houses, uh, the average bedrooms, the population of the area, the longitude, latitude, and the medium house value in that particular area. We're going to go ahead and try to run a regression problem about the medium household value in the area based off of the uh, income, the population, the longitude and the latitude of the area. This particular data set has a nice functionality here. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a cell. You don't need to follow along with this if you don't like, it's just showing one more uh, ability. So I'll go ahead and click insert a cell below here at the top. And I'm going to go ahead and write print uh, data set. And you can see that one of our extensions has shown us the capabilities of various functions. So as we write functions, you actually get um, the usage of them. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and write target. So our target value of this data set, the value that they expect you to try to predict, is the medium household value. And so we're going to go ahead and regress this problem here. If I'm interested more in the function fetch California housing data, uh, I can actually go ahead and select that particular package. I can right click it and I can go to jump to definition. This is a very popular IDE feature, which enables you to actually view the source code of the modules that you're utilizing. So if I look, I can see the source code for the fetch California housing data set. I can see uh, the doc strings that they have written here, I can see the parameters as well, uh, as well as the, you know, the visual pop-up that would occur if we were to write the function. Uh, but often it can be useful to kind of view the source code uh, as it's written here as well. I can go ahead and close that as well. Uh, and if you're particularly interested in more information about the data set, uh, this data set does come from scikit-learn. Uh, so feel free to check out uh, the scikit-learn California housing data set uh, with information and, and various examples that also utilize this. So we've loaded our data set. We've figured out the function for which is bringing that data set in. Now we want to go ahead and do some exploratory data analysis, some visualization. So one thing that's really handy about Studio Notebook kernels is that you can install various packages to them as well. You're not set with only the packages that are already available. So for this particular example, I'm going to install a couple libraries that'll be useful here, Plotly, Notebook Format, and Matplotlib. And I'm going to do this with the magic pip command. So pip install, dash q is just quiet. You don't have to use that, but I'm just trying to keep my notebook a little tidy. And I'm going to go ahead and install these libraries to my kernel. So the reason we're not seeing anything here is the dash quiet, obviously. Uh, so this has now completed. Uh, you may need to restart the kernel to use updated packages. We haven't imported these packages yet, so we should be fine. Um, and as such, you can actually see that our notebook and our IDE is actually yelling at us that we are importing libraries that are not at the top. Um, so for many notebook users, it is common to import libraries that you know throughout the notebook. 
Uh, and so what you can actually do is in the configuration file for your LCC or when you install these extensions through the terminal, uh, as you could say, you know, that this is a particular uh, violation of PyCode style that you're okay with, and then you wouldn't get the syntax highlighted. We're going to take our data set and we're going to actually compute some histograms here, uh, binning them across 15 categories, and we're going to plot some pl subplots using matplotlib. You'll see that we're able to kind of inspect our data set here. We can see that we can bin, bin the medium income. You can see it exists roughly here, uh, and I believe, which is, you know, uh, 40,000. Uh, you see the household, the age of the households. You can see there's probably a large building activity maybe 35 years ago in California. Uh, you can see uh, various average robots with some outliers, which we may want to clean up if we thought this was a critical uh, component of our uh, regression problem, which it may be. The population of the area has quite the skew to it, and we can actually see the medium house value, uh, which is what we will be trying to regress in today's problem. SageMaker Studio Notebooks also support visualizing data with Plotly for interactive data processing. So if I wanted to, say, plot a histogram of the house age with a little bit more detail and interactive ability, I can go ahead and run this cell here, which will bin it within 15 bins. And you can see that a interactive Plotly histogram plot has been created. I can move my cursor over this to see the actual counts, um, as well as various Plotly functionalities for other data set problems. A uh, very rich library with a lot of interactive plotting capabilities. Uh, but in this case, I'm just kind of using it to zoom in on this one particular uh, feature and get some more information gleaned from this. Uh, you can do things like zooming in to particular regions. Uh, where you can kind of get a various view, uh, and you can reset the zoom, you can uh, auto scale and things along those lines as well. So very nice, cool functionality of SageMaker Studio. We're going to do some data transformations. For this particular data set, uh, you can run this uh, locally within the notebook here. So we're going to do our data processing within the notebook. As we do our training jobs and kick off some longer running things, I'll show how we can actually run ephemeral processing jobs as well, uh, where you would no longer run it in the notebook. You would actually launch a container uh, for which you'll only be billed from the start of that job to the end of the job. And that's what's known as a SageMaker processing job. But often, you may just want to do your data transformations natively, uh, directly in the notebook as you're kind of accustomed to. So we're going to create some pandas data frames from our data set. Uh, we're going to utilize the train test split functionality uh, from scikit-learn. And then we're actually going to use the standard scalar functionality uh, to transform our data set. So let's say you wanted some more information about the standard scalar. You can go ahead and right click this here and then click jump to definition. And you'll be brought to the source page for standard scalar. Uh, here you can kind of view what is it doing. They give the actual algorithm here. So, you know, uh, taking the, subtracting the mean, divided by the standard deviation, uh, which is a common pattern in our machine learning data preprocessing. Going to go ahead and run this cell here, and you'll see that we're actually going to do some NumPy saving of these files uh, locally to disk. So if I go ahead and run this cell here, I can go over to my uh, directory file browser tab, which I've kind of minimized for the sake of this demo. And you can see that it will update shortly. Uh, you'll see the data directory has been created as well. And if I look in there, you'll see the train test splits for which we have just saved out. So we've prepared our data through the notebook. Let's go ahead and start building a model locally in the notebook. So utilizing the same instance and kernel to create a machine learning model based off this data. I'm going to go ahead and run this function known as get model, which actually comes from our Python module in the directory. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at what this file does. The reason that we're putting various functions in this Python file is we're actually going to scale out this job with ephemeral SageMaker trading jobs a little later. And for that, you pass it a script in order to run. It can be very convenient to import the same functions into your notebook so that you have no varying code and it's the exact same functionality that you've tested locally before you scale out on processing jobs. The get model functionality pulls a keras model 
uh, with an input shape uh, specific for this particular model. We have three dense layers um, as well as, and then wrapping it in a Keras model. So a very simple model, a couple different activation functions, uh, nothing you know groundbreaking as far as modeling here. Uh, so you know, temper your ex expectations for the results. But a great example of showing how you can use TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, anything along those lines to build your machine learning models. It's worth calling out that SageMaker itself provides a number of built-in algorithms to do things like this, exactly this regression problem. For this demo, we're just showing how you can do it with uh, low, uh, open source frameworks, with your own scripts. Uh, but be sure to check out the documentation on SageMaker built-in algorithms, where a lot of this process can even be simplified if you're not uh, keen on writing your own scripts uh, as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and run that function, and I'm going to print the model summary. Uh, you can see Keras has a nice model.summary view. You can see the various layers of our network. Uh, you can see the output shapes and the number of parameters that are available in each one. So you can see a very small model here, 113 total parameters. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use uh, the train model functionality that's also available in this script. So if we look at the train model, model functionality, we can see we're passing various parameters, uh, hyperparameters that we want to use to train our model. Uh, we have things uh, like uh, the optimizer pre-selected here as stochastic gradient descent. We're going to compile that model using mean squared error as our loss because we're doing a regression problem here. And then we're going to fit that model and evaluate the model on the test set as well. Lastly, it will save the model uh, to the output directory that we specify. I'm going to go ahead and run this cell here for 20 epics. And we can see that right directly locally in the notebook, we're able to train a Keras model using the data set that we have prepared. We can see our validation loss, and we can see the loss as it progresses down. There is some TensorFlow warnings, uh, which are quite familiar if you've used TensorFlow before. If I run it again, uh, we won't see the warnings again uh, because it's already been shared with us. So I'll do that just for the sake of cleanliness. It's rather quick to run this model. Realistically, you'll want to um, you know, look at your various, perhaps we could have ran some more epics here, and we'll do that later on as we kind of scale this out. We can see the mean squared error that was part of that uh, function. It printed it out. And lastly, we can see the assets were written to our output directory. So if I go to this uh, directory tab over here, again, this is my network drive specific to my user. Uh, I can see that the model has been written to the one directory. We can see the protobuf file and the various uh, variables that have been saved in the TensorFlow save model format. So that's great. We've shown how we can use SageMaker Studio Notebooks to train models directly into the notebook. Now what we're going to do is we're going to show how you can utilize the rest of the SageMaker environment to actually train these models using a more scalable approach. So we're going to do things like hyperparameter optimization. Uh, we're going to do uh, ephemeral job trainings, uh, where you can actually leverage things like spot instances and a lot of other cool things too. So to start, we're going to use our Boto3 uh, AWS SDK. Um, so hypothetically, if you weren't uh, very familiar with Boto3, we're going to show some more of the uh, JupyterLab extension capabilities that we've installed here. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a new cell. And let's say I just want to see what's available from Boto3. So I can type Boto3 as a module, type a period, and then you can actually go ahead and hit tab, oops, not Boto33. Um, and you can see the various uh, capabilities for Boto3. Uh, so you can see uh, that there is data, there is EC2, uh, S3 is a common Boto3 thing that we'll be using. There's sessions where you can actually uh, spawn different sessions for various AWS services like SageMaker. Um, and this capability for, uh, for tab completion uh, is one of the functionalities that we have uh, pre-installed through the Jupyter LSP uh, extension, Jupyter Lab LSP extension. So very helpful and a modern feature of IDEs that is commonly used. Because we've already kind of built this notebook out for you, uh, we'll be using less tab completion, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear that that's some of the nice functionality that we have enabled here. Another really nice functionality that's built into the JupyterLab 3 um, <coughs> IDE itself uh, without the need of extension installed from us uh, is this fourth tab down here known as the table of contents. 
So you can see in this particular notebook, uh, and it's a little large because I'm quite zoomed in for the demo, uh, but you can see that all of the various markdown headings we hear automatically built a uh, table of contents of what we're going through. So if we go ahead and look back at what we've kind of covered to this point, we'll see that we had our exploratory data analysis, we had our plotting libraries, our data transforms, our model building, and now we're on to the using SageMaker training jobs for scaling our training out. It's worth noting that this table of contents tab as well also works for the Python files as well. Uh, so you can go ahead and see here, you can see it actually breaks them up into the various uh, uh, functions defined, which is pretty, pretty slick. So let's get moving with our experiment here. We're going to go ahead and initialize a uh, Boto3 SageMaker client here. Uh, we can utilize get execution rule, which we imported earlier. Uh, because we have already authenticated ourselves to the Studio ID environment, there's no need to pass around secret keys or passwords. Uh, you have inherited the various set of permissions that is associated with your SageMaker user. We'll go ahead and run that cell. And lastly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload our training and testing data to an S3 bucket where it can be easily accessed from these ephemeral training jobs that I had discussed. One of the key things we're going to show through the uh, scalable training here is we're going to be launching many training jobs where we're going to be slightly altering the parameters that go into our models. We're going to use SageMaker experiments, as Kunal mentioned in the beginning of this talk, to kind of do a comparison of the various trials that we are running so that we can find the optimized performance. To do this, we're going to import the SageMaker experiments library. And then we're going to go ahead and create a particular California housing experiment. We'll be able to see this through the graphical interface here shortly. Uh, what we can do as far as charting and plotting and comparing our different runs. So let's go ahead and kick off some training runs so that we can watch their experiments uh, results uh, in the graphical interface. So to start here, what we're going to do is we're actually going to build a set of hyperparameters that we want to search over. So this is not using the SageMaker hyperparameter tuner. We'll do that a little bit later in this demonstration. This is more of a you know a preset grid search. If there was hyperparameters that you wanted to make sure were ran, you can go ahead and, and do it in this uh, fashion here. Uh, you can see we have a set of various hyperparameters, and we're going to actually iterate through all of those sets. We're going to use what's known as the TensorFlow estimator uh, for SageMaker training. Uh, we have a PyTorch estimator, an MXNet estimator, uh, as well as a base estimator where you can bring your own containers for these type of jobs. Uh, but we'll go ahead and use the TensorFlow container because it uh, has some uh, convenience functions uh, built in for utilizing containers that support TensorFlow. Specifically, the containers that AWS and SageMaker provide um, out of the box that are regularly sc scanned for security, et cetera. Again, if I'm interested a little bit more in the TensorFlow uh, estimator, I can go ahead and jump to definition here and actually view uh, the specifics of this class so I can have a better understanding of what kind of parameters can be passed to this uh, example, et cetera. I'm going to loop through the various hyperparameters that I have specified above. Let me zoom in again. And what's going to happen is I'm going to mark these as a individual trial. So each setting each training job with a set of hyperparameters will be a trial within my experiment. I'm going to go ahead and log various metric definitions. Uh, so these are regex values that you can actually uh, record uh, based on the standard out standard error of your container. So if you have um, you know, a function that's printing the loss, you can use print or logging. Uh, you can actually pick those up uh, using this really convenient metric definitions regex. Lastly, for our estimator, which is the deployed um, ephemeral training job, you can see that we're pointing to an entry point. Uh, and this particular entry point is going to be the California housing tf2.py file that we've already been utilizing. So we're going to reuse the exact same code, uh, but now we're going to be doing this in a uh, kind of scalable uh, ephemeral job. You get to actually select the instance count, the instance type that you want to run it on, the framework version, the Python version. You get to pass hyperparameters. So in this particular use case, we're actually going to pass these learning rates and epics as hyperparameters to our script. 
if you look at the top of the script, you'll notice that we have a uh, standard Python arg parser, which accepts these various hyperparameters. So things like learning rate, epics, and batch size uh, can be passed to this particular estimator. And that's what we're going to do. Lastly, we go ahead and fit the estimator with our input data, in this case, specified by the S3 locations that we had updated, uploaded. I want to talk about this weight equals false parameter here because it's quite useful when building models in the notebook uh, notebooks themselves. Uh, so what this does is if you have weight equals true, it will uh, synchronously wait for this job to complete. So your notebook cell will stay executing while that job runs and the various logs are actually printed directly into your notebook. So I'm going to do that to show how it works. Uh, but to start, I want to kick off the three jobs uh, that are running these hyperparameters uh, right away. And for that, I'm going to use weight equals false so that this loop just goes ahead and kicks off three jobs. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and run this cell as is to start. And we'll see that it quickly completes um, because what we're doing here is we're launching uh, the various jobs. You can see it's already completed, uh, but there's obviously no way we've trained three models. So uh, how can we go ahead and, and watch those models um, train? As I mentioned, and we'll do this shortly, if I make this weight equals true, uh, you'll be able to kind of view the container logs directly in your notebook. Um, but if I uh, wanted to look elsewhere, you can actually go to the SageMaker console again, where we started today's demo. And if I go to the training tab here and I look at training jobs, I can see that those three jobs that I've just kicked off are all actively in progress right now. So I'm going to launch one more job um, just to show the ability of printing the logs directly into the notebook. Uh, feel free to follow along with this part. You don't need to. Uh, it may just be worth just kind of watching. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit these cells here a little bit. I'm going to make the learning rate just one value I want to iterate on, and I'm going to lower the epics as well just for the logging verbosity. And you can see that now my um, hyperparameters that I want to launch a job for are just one combination of learning rate and a small epic batch. So I can go ahead and rerun this cell here, and it will log to the same experiment because we have we're utilizing the exact same uh, experiment info uh, that we've already set. And we'll see that shortly in the, in the graphical interface. Uh, but this time, I'm going to go ahead and say weight equals true. So we can see how that looks when we run it this way. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and run. So now you'll see it's a little bit different. You can see that it says starting the training job, and it's now provisioning a EC2 instance for me. If I go ahead and look at the notebook, you can see that this cell is still continuously running uh, because this is now synchronous, and it's waiting for the results of the job before the cell has completed. If I go back to the console and I refresh over here, you'll see that we do have four jobs running now. Uh, and they're all going to be associated with the same experiment, so we can do uh, some comparing and contrasting between them. Once this instance has started, we'll actually get to see the logs written directly into the notebook, which is quite convenient. This particular job takes maybe three, four minutes. So I'll let it get started here. Uh, but then I'm going to poke around uh, throughout the IDE, show some other features. Um, this can be a good time to catch up with the virtual workshop if you're a little bit behind. Um, and uh, feel free to pause the video if you're watching this on the recording. So we can see now that we are preparing the instance for training. And while that runs, I'm going to go ahead and go to this second to bottom tab here, known as the SageMaker resources, and just kind of poke around the IDE, show some of the features uh, that encompasses the SageMaker Studio IDE uh, that differentiates it from uh, standard IDEs and makes this a machine learning IDE. So you see from the dropdown, there's a lot of different options here. There are things known as SageMaker projects, which are pre-provisioned templates for your workloads uh, that your DevOps teams or administrators can set up for you. Uh, we have things like pipelines for workflow orchestration. Uh, we're going to be looking a lot at the experiments and trials today. We have model registry, 
deployed endpoints, which we'll quickly look at towards the end of this uh, section after we've deployed our best model. Uh, we have compilation jobs, edge packaging for uh, ML at the edge, as well as cluster capability. If you want to connect to a Amazon e EMR cluster to do distributed data processing in Spark, uh, we have a very nice graphical interface and connectivity uh, for that as well. Uh, we recently cre created a webinar for that as well. So if you're interested, feel free to check that out as well. If I click the experiments and trials here, uh, you'll see that our experiment name, TensorFlow 2 California Housing is created. And there's actually four various trial components for it. Uh, these are the four training jobs that we have launched. So we'll go ahead and inspect the results of these after the training jobs complete. Uh, but just wanted to show that you know we are actively collecting information about these jobs, specifically the metric definitions that we're recording here, uh, loss, accuracy, validation loss, and validation accuracy. So we can see that we're downloading the input data to this uh, launched instance. There's actually several different types of uh, data input um, uh, modes that you can select for these ephemeral jobs. Uh, the most common is what's known as file mode, where we actually copy the data to the instance. Uh, but as you scale up into uh, you know, uh, 10 plus gigs of data, uh, there's ways that you can uh, pipe or stream the um, data directly to the instances, so there's no need for copies. Uh, we have something known as fast file mode too recently to kind of uh, put uh, traditional POSIX uh, files on the system so it works uh, kind of as expected. Our training job is now running for that fourth job that we launched. We can see that these are the actual standard out standard error logs of our uh, container so we can actually see uh you know the various information it's printing the environment variables that we've sent to here it's printing all of the hyperparameters that we've sent uh, to the instance and then you can see your kind of traditional uh caras logging here so you can see that we are uh running through the data set here uh, and we're going to actually do 10 epics of this training here so it shouldn't take too long um and in fact it is already completed here so we can see um that we are uh, completed. And we are now writing the assets to S3 this time because it's not connected to your local EFS, but you can easily pull it down and the job has completed. Go ahead and clear this cell just for kind of hygiene of my notebook because I'm gonna bounce around a little bit on you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and right click and clear outputs of this cell. going to go over to my console here just to confirm. You can see that all four of these jobs have completed now that we've started from training. Uh, so let's go ahead and inspect the experiment uh, and trial analysis here. Uh, so from the SageMaker resources, as we kind of mentioned already, uh, you know, the four different trial of our experiments are available. So I'm going to go ahead and select all four of them, actually. Right click and click Open and Trial Component List. You can see that there's various information available uh, for these. Uh, you can see you know, who was created by, the users, workshop user. Uh, you can have tags. Um, but there's actually a lot more information that's been stored for these. So if I go ahead and click this little uh, wheel icon here in the top right, you can see the various columns that I can set here. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the experiment name um, just to kind of clear it out a little bit. Uh, take out who's, who was created by. And now I'm going to put in the metrics, which I'm really most interested in, things like um, the loss, the validation loss. Um, and so with that, I can actually, uh, you know, sort by the lowest loss of these experiments, perhaps, uh, and kind of identify what was the best training job that I had here. We can do plotting here as well. So if I go ahead and select all four of them uh, and I click add a chart, I can go ahead and um, select this uh, wheel icon again for my new chart, click the chart. Um, and then you can go ahead and plot various of the trial comparisons. So I'm gonna go ahead and plot a time series data, uh, a line chart. Um, I'm going to do the X dimension as the periods from start. So basically how long into the job was it running? And then I'm gonna do X axis aggregation of every five minutes. And I'm going to select a uh, value. I wanna do the average loss to see how this looks across them. Um, perhaps every one minute is likely because this was kind of quick training. So you can see the various trial components are all plotted within this graph here. Uh, and you can actually kind of watch as they 
how they ran. Uh, the fourth job I ran was actually, you know, slighter uh, or less number of epics. Uh, and so that's why you can see it ran not as long as some of the others. Um, but yeah, a lot of different ways you can do comparison analysis to determine what was your best um, experiment. So we'll go back to the uh, notebook now. Uh, and you can see it kind of describes this a little bit in Markdown on how that can work as well. So that was great. We kicked off uh, four different SageMaker training jobs using a loop and kind of you know set hyperparameters that we wanted to investigate. Uh, but let's assume that we don't know the hyperparameters that we want to investigate. Uh, so one of the very popular things uh, in machine learning today is what's known as hyperparameter optimization, uh, where we'll actually use algorithms to determine what those hyperparameters should be, things like the learning rate. Um, so what you can do is you can use this from SageMaker Tuner uh, you can actually go ahead and set a continuous parameter that you want to search over. Uh, there's also categorical parameters or integer parameters as well. Uh, but for this case, I'm going to search in this range of uh, learning rates. Again, we're going to set our metric definitions for the container. Uh, and then we're actually going to set the metric name that we're looking to minimize. So the optimizer needs to know what uh, metric is of importance to us uh, when making new choices for hyperparameters and what we should be trying to do. Should we try to minimize it or maximize it? So in this case, we're going to minimize the loss. Again, you kind of simply make a TensorFlow estimator to start. Uh, you know, you said your instance count, uh, the instance type. Uh, and again, we're pointing to that entry point of that script. And now we're actually going to wrap that estimator in the hyperparameter tuner. Um, so a very kind of convenient functionality here um, that you can now wrap that one estimator and say, I want to run three estimators at a time, and then I want to run six total. So there'll be two rounds of hyperparameter tuning. Uh, we're going to use a Bayesian, Bayesian updating strategy. Uh, so basically, those first three will run. Uh, it'll analyze which ones did best, and then it'll kick off another three based off that information of the hyperparameter search. Uh, we'll pass our objective metric names, and then we're going to fit this to the data as well. So we'll go ahead and get this running, because it's going to take a few minutes, because there's two rounds of three jobs. If I go over to the uh, uh, console again, I can see hyperparameter tuning jobs as a section under training. And you can see that I have actively started kicking off uh, this particular um, HPO. And then the jobs, we should see three more running. And then once those three complete, we'll get another three that have been updated based off those results. So just going forward to kind of show where we're going to finish with this, we're going to do some analysis on that particular uh, tuning job. Uh, we're also going to uh, deploy the best instance of that tuner uh, to a real-time endpoint. Um, one of the very nice functionalities of the SageMaker environment is the ability to host real-time endpoints uh, for your models. Uh, we have the capability for serverless endpoints as well as 24-7 RESTful models. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to pass uh, some portion of our testing data set to a real-time predictor uh, to get those results. Um, but first, we need to utilize the SageMaker hyperparameter tuner uh, to tell us what the best model it was able to create, given the range that we asked it to search over. This will take about six minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to use this time to kind of uh, move around the IDE, show some other functionalities uh, that you may like to use. Uh, in particular, uh, we do have uh, native debugging built into the JupyterLab uh, 3 notebooks. Uh, you need to select uh, one of our two uh, kernels that support it at this moment. Uh, so the Data Science 2.0 or the base Python 2.0 kernels. Uh, and that supports full debugging, uh, a native feature of JupyterLab 3, which is really great. can also go up to the settings here. And if I go ahead and click Advanced Settings Editor, uh, you can see um, some of the different uh, settings that we can adjust for this particular um, IDE. And particularly, the extensions that you install also have settings that you can adjust from here. Uh, so you can see Language Server is actually an option here. So if I go ahead and click Language Server, you can see the various uh, changes I can make here. Uh, sometimes it's easier to just view them as a JSON editor. Um, and then... You can see like the Jupyter code formatter. Uh, a lot of the configurations that we'd want to update here are things like PEP8 rules, the black line length that we had set, 
um, format on the save. So previously I clicked the button to format my notebook, but you could have just had it so that every time the notebook saves, it auto formats, uh, which can be very useful for teams that you know have that as a requirement. Uh, so it's always the same. You can sort uh, imports and a lot of really nice preferences that you can set from uh, the JupyterLab code formatter, for example. Additionally, we can look at the language server and look at the, the various language servers that are being utilized here, set various um, functionalities. So a lot of really nice functionality here. If I go back to the SageMaker resources and I go to the experiments and trials home, um, I can actually go ahead and refresh this. And you'll see now that our uh, hyperparameter optimization tuner is automatically creating an experiment with associated trials. Um, so previously in the notebook, I was associating the experiment uh, with each estimator I ran. So you can see I built like an experiment config and I passed that experiment config to the estimator launch. Um, with hyperparameter tuning, it's known that you're going to have several trials and you're likely going to want to analyze them against each other. Uh, so you don't need to do that. Uh, and in fact, it automatically creates an experiment over here with the various associated trials. You can see that I have uh, six jobs running. So that tells me that the first three likely completed. And you can see they did complete. Uh, and now we're running our next three. Um, which is very useful. Um, from the console, if I wanted to click any particular job, uh, you can see what hyperparameters are actually passed into this. Uh, so you can see the learning rate that ran in this job, uh, you know, 0 0.00711384. Um, so a, a great example of showing how hyperparameter tuners find values uh, that are optimal uh, that humans would never have input. Like, so I, I would have never set the learning rate to be this value. Uh, you really need a computer to kind of search over the continuous space uh, to come up with some of these, you know, more preferable values or, or better performing values. So very cool. You can see that three out of our six uh, for hyperparameter job have trained, and the other three are in progress right now. So we're getting there. Once those three complete, um, this cell here uh, will complete as well. So we'll be aware of the the, the ending of that hyperparameter tuner. Let's say you wanted a little bit more information about continuous parameters, or maybe to see what other type of parameters are here. Uh, you can go up here and you can jump to definition as well. I don't do that. I believe I can do that right now, but I'll just wait for the cell to finish first. I think we're almost done. The last thing I wanted to talk about is SageMaker processing jobs. Uh, so for this particular example, if I go to the table of contents, I can like actually easily go to data transformations, you see, and I can jump right up to it. Uh, so apologies if I've been scrolling a little bit too much on you all. Uh, I'm still getting kind of uh, used to going to the table of contents, which is really useful. And you can see that we did our kind of data processing directly in the notebook, and that worked very well for this particular data set. Um, but there may be instances where you need to do kind of distributed data processing. Uh, maybe you need to kick off six instances to kind of work your way through a very large data set. Uh, what you can do here is you can use SageMaker processing. So SageMaker processing works kind of very much like the training jobs. They're basically ephemeral jobs where you kick them off. You only pay from the start to the finish. Uh, and essentially, you know, it's some S3 bucket of data or many buckets. Um, that is being uh, passed into the processing container. And this could be you know, one instance or five instances where you're splitting the data across them. Uh, and you're running your particular uh, processing job. Uh, we have built-in containers for things like scikit-learn. Uh, actually, the deep learning frameworks have processing containers as well. Uh, but you're welcome to just build a generic Docker container uh, that if you so choose, uh, or Apache Spark. Uh, and you can use these to uh, transform your data into an output S3 bucket. Uh, if you need that kind of uh, processing power. So just to show what that looks like in code a little bit here, um, you can see very similar to our estimator here. You basically set a script processor, um, and then you go ahead and run that script processor, pointing to the input S3 bucket, uh, and then where you want to write your output. So pretty straightforward interface uh, and very useful to kind of scale uh, data processing, just as we're kind of scaling our model training here. 
So again, I can kind of use the table of contents here to kind of jump down to hyperparameter tuning. And we can see that our job has completed. Again, if I wanted more information on this continuous parameter, I'm going to right click here and click jump to definition. And then you'll actually be brought into the SageMaker SDK uh, where you can view the information about continuous parameters, categorical parameters, et cetera. Now I want to do some analysis on my tuner here. So I'm just going to quickly comment these lines here and kind of show how, again, you know, if I have a tuner here uh, and I'm not quite sure of the various methods that I want to use, I can do tuner dot and then hit tab for tab completion. And I can see that there's a lot of really nice things here, like the best training job, return the name of the best training job. That seems very useful. Um, and there's a lot of different things. You can actually deploy the best training model. So you can see the documentation for it here, deploy the best trained or user specified model to an Amazon SageMaker endpoint. A lot of really nice functionality kind of is already built in there. Um, so um, for what I wanna do, I happen to know what I'm looking to do. I'm gonna do tuner.analytics and I'm gonna look at the training job summaries. This is a JSON. It's not the most human readable version, but it's certainly readable. Um, but this can be really used for programmatic usage of the uh, SageMaker experiments uh, and SageMaker hyperparameter optimizations. Uh, if you have some kind of um, downstream consumer of this uh, and you want a programmatic access to the results, uh, you can do things like this, which work very nicely. As we saw previously, these also appear in the uh, experiments. So if you have a kind of a graphical tab, if you want to like click on any one of these individually, uh, you can see various components of any given trial. You can see the metrics that were uh, created for it, You know your objective metric, your validation loss. You can see the parameters that were passed into any experiment, the data that was submitted to it. So you can kind of build your data lineage here, uh, as well as AWS settings. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool functionality around debugger explainability uh, that is probably just outside the scope of today's uh, lesson, uh, but there's quite a lot to learn there. Lastly, I'm going to go ahead and deploy this. So if you do tuner at the dot deploy, it automatically deploys the best uh, estimator that was created. So I'm just going to go ahead and run that. It takes a few minutes to get going. Um, and then this is actually going to be a RESTful endpoint, and we'll actually be able to pass data to it and get real-time predictions. going to show some more features of the Studio IDE. You can see here, if I click this third button down, uh, this kind of play button, you can see the running instance that I have and then the apps that I'm running as well. Uh, so for this particular uh, session right now, I have just one T3 medium running with one TensorFlow 2.3 kernel uh, using on it. Uh, these instances will use uh, can fit up to four apps on them, depending on your kind of CPU usage. Uh, so it does smartly try to allocate the apps to the same instances. Um, but one of the really nice and flexible features of SageMaker Studio is you can run several different types of instances. Uh, you know, if I wanted a GPU-backed instance to run my notebook, for example, you could do that. Uh, if we were doing, you know, when we did our model training, if it was a bit heavier uh, and we wanted to actually use GPU acceleration, uh, we saw that there were GPU-optimized kernels that we could have used um, and, and leveraged those directly from the notebook without the need to launch a trading job. Um, so it's really worth calling out that, you know, launching the trading job uh, is... Um, one pattern, uh, but you can also build your notebooks, uh, build your models directly in the notebooks as we had kind of done very early on. Shouldn't take too much longer to get our endpoints stood up. If we go back to the console over here, uh, we can see some more of the functionalities here. You can see your lifecycle configurations, uh, processing jobs that you have ran. Um, and under inference, we're actually going to be able to see our endpoints that we're creating. So if we go to endpoint configurations, uh, we've already kind of, uh, it's auto-generated endpoint configuration for us uh, using uh, the hyperparameter settings. And then we have our endpoints that are uh, active and so you can see that this one that's actively going right now is in the process of being created 
Uh, so we could refresh this here as well as, uh, well, there you go. Look at that, good timing. In service, and if I go back to the notebook, uh, we should get a return statement from this very shortly. Slightly surprised it's not here right now. It's probably formulating a response um, back to the notebook. And there you go, it's completed. So lastly, we're going to use this predictor here uh, to actually pass some data. Uh, we're going to use just kind of 10 rows from our test set. Um, these are RESTful endpoints, so you can do this uh, through a number of methods, through the SageMaker SDK, uh, through um, just a, a RESTful uh, call as well. Uh, and you can see that um, you can see the results printed for each of those 10 values. If you're running this uh, example and, and workshop in your own account, uh, it's probably a good idea to delete the endpoint as well, because those those um, endpoints will the endpoint that we stood up here is a 24/7 endpoint, um, restful endpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete it simply. And lastly, if you're in a, your own account, uh, you want to go up to this third tab down over here uh, and go ahead and shut down the instances that are running to back your notebooks. Um, just going to go ahead and shut those down. You can see that by shutting down the instance, it tells me that it's going to shut down all of the various uh, notebooks and apps that are running. That's fine. We've completed today's demo. I'm going to go ahead and shut those down. I want to thank you all for attending this workshop. I hope it was very valuable. Uh, again, my name is Sean Morgan, uh, and looking forward to uh, working with you all and hope you enjoy your SageMaker Studio experience. Thank you.